This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Welcome to Bewilderbeast. I'm your host, Melissa Mickey McGrath, recording from the North Pole, surrounded by eight very misunderstood rain does. Okay, let's go. This week, my kiddo got to meet some reindeer, real reindeer in person. Okay, now this next part (laughs) needs to be qualified. I only overheard part of what was happening behind me while a herd of children were all eagerly waiting to meet the reindeer. So the information might not be fully accurate, but from what I understand, the guy who brought in the two reindeer for kids to meet without touching them because, you know, autonomy matters is the only guy in our state allowed to have reindeer. He has seven, including the reindeer mama and five-month-old baby, another little lady. And no one else in the state of Maine is allowed to have reindeer. But he also can't leave the state with his reindeer. The thing that fascinated me was that this baby reindeer already had antlers. And that just blew my mind. She's five and a half months old. And as you'll learn in today's episode, Mama also still had her antlers, but the males don't. Which leads to my favorite fun fact of the holiday season that always comes up this time of year. Santa's sleigh? Yeah. Guess who's pulling the entire weight of Christmas? Around the globe in a single night and does not need to stop and ask for directions. But we'll get to it. So for the rest of December, I'm going to be remastering some of the episode segments from last year before I knew how compressing audio worked, and I'm going to be adding some music underneath, so I hope it stays fresh, festive, and enjoyable. I'm going to be pulling out some of the other segments from these three December episodes from season one and put them out as little snacks for you during the rest of the holiday season. So next week, expect a regular episode on Monday, a famous chef whose first recipe was for shark repellent. I'm so excited. And a few minis scattered throughout. So if you haven't, subscribe. And Patreons, don't forget, you'll be getting your extra episode this month, and I'm hoping to put two out for you because you guys have been so awesome this year. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So that's coming. I I just love this time of year. So let's start with today's topic inspired by the new friends that we met yesterday in person. All reindeer at humanity. Y'all ready to deck some halls? Let's do this. The downside, kids, to adults is that we, and I am absolutely including myself in here, tend to lose belief in magical things. We get too stuffy, too serious, and that's really too bad. I think the best part of the holiday season, especially the Christmas season, is the idea of magic and belief. It's the one time of year that kids can tell adults to just put aside what they consider silly things like reason and sense and give in to what kids know to be true. For example, we all know that Santa's reindeer can fly, but some adults might try to explain this away with silly things like science and reason. And the other 11 months of the year, science is the guiding light of this podcast. Christmas is no different. So what are you going to believe? Well, 
let's look at my favorite tenant, Occam's razor. Now, Occam's razor, it's not a real razor. It can't actually hurt you, unless you consider being wrong painful. Occam's razor is a theory, and it's that the easiest answer is often the correct one. So if a parent walked in and saw a kiddo with chocolate chip residue on their lips, crumbs on their shirt, and they are still chewing, is it more likely that the kid going, I, I didn't do it, somebody <clears throat> gulp. I didn't do it. Someone broke into the house and they ate all the cookies on the fridge. And then they rubbed their dirty, gross hands all over my face. And then they got chocolate there. And then they got crumbs all over my sweater. And then this thing I'm chewing, yeah, it's my tongue. Or is it really more likely that that kid ate the cookies and is lying? Occam's razor. The simplest answer, supported by evidence, is often most correct. So hypothetical kid, just own up to eating the cookies and also ask for milk. So which is easier to believe about reindeer who fly? One theory, which I enjoy but holds very little water as you are going to see, is that shaman and holy men of old-timey times would harvest and pick mushrooms, specifically Amanita muscaria or holy mushroom. They would then dry these mushrooms out and deliver them as presents during the solstice, the darkest night of the year, which happens at around the 21st of December. Now, taking a leap that people would walk out into the woods in the dark and the cold to get special mushrooms, take the time to dry them out while freezing and not hunting for food, and then ingest these hallucinogenic mushrooms, meaning these particular mushrooms make you see things that aren't even there, hallucinate, to the point where they are seeing reindeer flying. Yeah, right. Or better yet, the reindeer might have thought that they were flying because they were also eating these mushrooms. This sounds a bit complicated, right? According to Business Insider, if you look at the evidence, you find that shaman didn't travel by sleigh, they didn't deal with reindeer spirits, very rarely they took the mushrooms to get into trances, and they didn't have red and white clothing, said Ronald Hutton, a history professor of the University of Bristol, talking to NPR in 2010. So Occam's razor? Shaman taking hallucinogenic shrooms found in the woods in the bitter cold, using precious energy resources before Luna bars were a thing, give illegal drugs as gifts, and as a unit have a massive trip on the night of the solstice and everyone happened to see flying reindeer. Or that kids are right, and there are nine reindeer who can fly. According to the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, Santa's reindeer subspecies is R.T. Santa Claus Magicalis, and they are the eighth subspecies of caribou and reindeer, as caribou and reindeer are the exact same species. I think, personally, that adults have an amazing capacity to bend facts to suit their own fiction and tend to underestimate kids' perspectives, which are often correct. Let's get down to it. Reindeer are amazing. For starters, reindeer live in areas where they may not have light for months of the year. Or they might even have the opposite problem, light reflecting off of snow for several months of the year, which can lead to snow blindness. See, I read in a book by Blair Braverman, a woman who has run the Iditarod, and she had mentioned in her book, linked below, but I can't say the full title here due to some cursing in the title. So um, I'm going to need to call in an old favorite. Andrew Jackson's bird, can you help me out? Welcome to the <laughs> mice cube. Thanks, Paul. Blair documents in this book that she had the unfortunate experience of having a sunburn up her nostrils. From the light reflecting off the glacier she was living on, the sun, even in the bitter cold, can be so dangerous to animals who haven't evolved protection or for people who don't have the right piece of protective equipment. Reindeer do have the right equipment, including in some reindeer, a red nose that Rudolph would be envious of. You see, reindeer have dense arrays of capillaries in their noses to help keep their bodies supported through the harsh winter. And in some of these deer, the capillaries appear pink. So yes, Virginia, there really is a red-nosed reindeer, and it's more common than the traditional Santa stories might lead you to believe. There's a warm flow of blood that warms the air that the reindeer breathe in. 
So reindeer, not only do they have their noses warm up air before it hits the lungs, their entire bodies, including their hooves, are covered with fur. If they didn't have all these capillaries warming the air, this fantastic real-life animal superpower, even the very nature of breathing in the Arctic air while they're running from prey could give reindeer brain freeze. And that would be such a super bummer, especially since they didn't even get a benefit of a nice double scoop of haagen Now, it's no secret that Rudolph is the latest reindeer to be added to Santa's crew. He was added to the roster in 1939, so the original eight, or ten, and we'll talk about them in a minute, needed a little extra support. But so did Robert L. May, the man who went on to introduce us all to Rudy. See, Robert L. May was really a smart kid who skipped a few grades in school. And as a result, he was always smaller and, yes, weaker than the kids in his class, which made him a target. And according to his daughter, he always saw himself as a nerdy kid and a loser, a misfit, an outcast. And as a kid who was picked on a lot as a kiddo herself and felt the same way, it's not hard to see how Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer came out of a childhood like this. Not in the least. Now, when Robert L. May was hired as an adult to write catalogs to send out to Montgomery Ward, Montgomery Ward was a department store in Chicago, where before the internet, people would go and shop. In person. Whoa. But these catalogs, they used to sell shirts and soap and the newest gadgets of the day, and coloring books to give out to kids during the holidays. It was one of these catalogs where Robert L. May wrote a poem and made illustrations to show off Rudolph, Santa's newest flying teammate. Just after World War II, Gene Autry, the singing cowboy, wrote the song that we all know and love today. And you will hear on Spotify holiday playlist at least 100 times before New Year's Eve. And while Rudolph has the benefit of a nose that is so lit, all the other reindeer are also have special eyes to help aid them through the virtually sunless days of the northern environments. Reindeer have the ability to see ultraviolet light, which helps for months of dark, and are also unaffected by snow blindness, which helps for months of sun. Reindeer can easily see a predator's urine in the snow. They can spot other reindeer through storms and even see food below the ice and all without a glowing nose. They have other reflective coating behind their eyes that help bounce more light into their retinas, enhancing their night vision. So now that we know that all reindeer, including those you might see at the zoo or flying overhead, can see in the dark, how on earth did kids around the world learn the name of those eight deer in particular? Well, you know the story, "'Twas the Night Before Christmas by Clement Seymour. See, he wrote it in 1823. That was about 200 years ago. To help you recall... "'Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house. Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse." That was the poem that introduced us to eight named reindeer. And here is the relevant bit. "'When what to my wandering eyes should appear? But a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer, with a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in that moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles his coursers they came, He whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen. On Comet, on Cupid, on Dunder and Blixem. You might notice that two of the names you might know aren't quite the same as the ones that I read. Dunder and Blixem. Which I had to read twice. Because I kept reading it as Dunder and Mifflin. And now I want nothing more than Michael Scott and Dwight Schrute from the office to dress as reindeer. Dunder and Blixem are Dutch for Thunder and Lightning which over time was recalled in the German Donder and Blitzen, also Thunder and Lightning, and in American English became Donner and Blitzen. Meaning, I don't know. This is basically how American English works in a lot of ways. We tend to take words from other cultures and languages, use them, and like every game of telephone kids play on the schoolyard grounds, the words become muddled and not quite right by the time they get back to the original source. In an attempt to piggyback on the fame of the eight reindeer from Clement Seymour's Night Before Christmas, another guy jumped in, one you likely have heard of, L. Frank Baum, the guy who wrote The Wizard of Oz. He tried to rewrite the history of the reindeer by making his own reindeer names and even added two more, bringing the total to ten. These deer had rhyming pairing names, so you had Flossie and Glossy, Racer and Pacer, 
fearless and peerless, ready and steady, feckless and speckless. These didn't stick. For starters, peerless means without friends, and that's not ideal. And feckless means irresponsible. So I think going after the OG deer was a swing and a miss from L. Frank Baum. We'd rather have names that we don't understand, hey Dunder, hey Mifflin, than names that insult the deer who pulls Santa's beloved sled. Did you notice I said miniature sleigh and tiny reindeer? "'Twas the night before Christmas, that's how we are introduced to Santa's sleigh. "'When what to my wandering eyes should appear, "'a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer, "'with a little old driver so lively and quick, "'I knew in a moment it must be Saint Nick. "'Now, I don't know about you, "'but I generally think of Santa as a jolly fat guy, "'not a lively and quick man, "'and I think of the reindeer and sleigh as massive, "'needing their weight and heft to pull the toys "'all around the world in a single night.' But the image of eight deer the size of chihuahuas and a sleigh the size of a Ford Pinto driven by an athletic Nick from Dick's Sporting Goods does kind of make me smile. And I hope it does you too. Ho, ho, ho! And speaking of size, there is a debate a Bruin about the reindeer gender. In many articles, it said that Santa's sleigh is pulled by eight male reindeer. However... I'm going to drop some mind-blowing knowledge on all y'all. Unlike most deer species, both male and female reindeer grow antlers. And it's that simple fact led by some people to call foul on the flying deer's gender. And for that, I'm ever thankful. You see, lady deer drop their antlers in the summer, while male reindeer keep their antlers for fighting other males during the breeding season, and they drop their antlers later in the year. In the winter. Specifically... Male reindeer drop their antlers in the weeks leading up to Christmas time. So come December 24th, most male reindeer heads are naked and their bodies are weaker given how much energy they use up to fight off other males and then use whatever energy stores they have left to mate with the females. And according to some resources, they leave it all in the field. They are so weakened by fighting and by mating that they wouldn't even be able to pull anything except for maybe their pride. I don't even think they would be able to give it up for a high five from another male deer at the pub. So not only would Santa's reindeer have to be female to have those nice racks on their heads, but to be so big and strong enough to pull a sleigh full of toys that they would have to be in peak physical condition, which all signs point to Santa's sleigh being pulled by eight female reindeer. That's the patriarchy for you ladies. You do all the work and eight dudes get all the credit. Typical. However, keep in mind that we are talking about reindeer as scientists have seen and studied. Santa's reindeer? Well, they are likely a breed of reindeer who we have yet to study effectively. For instance, if Santa magic can get the reindeer to fly, I don't see any reason that the deer who pull his sleigh overnight all around the world, through every imaginable weather condition, couldn't be male retain their velveteen antlers, their muscle mass, their strength. Huh. Occam's razor bites again. Given the fact that they don't ever get lost, I suspect even Santa couldn't breed such a reindeer that the males don't need help with directions. So to quote Beyonce, who run the world? No, literally, who run the world while pulling a sled full of toys for all the good girls and boys? Girls. So until further scientific study confirms otherwise, I am solidly on Team Rain Doe. Okay, thank you for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. These were two stories from Episode 15, Season 1, Christmas Carol Creatures. If you are missing about, like, the 12 Days of Christmas Birds... Don't you worry, that's coming down the pike. I'm going to be pulling out some other segments from these last three December episodes, as I mentioned at the top, so stay tuned. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, or other North Pole animals that I should be aware of, send them in. BewilderBeastPod at gmail.com. Tweet at BewilderedPod, BewilderBeastPod on Facebook, and BewilderBeast on Instagram. I'm Melissa McKee McGrath with Mud Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from episode 15, Christmas Carol Creatures. 
All of the resources and links are found in those show notes. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz. Interstitial music is by MK2. Additional music is provided by Pixabay and freesound.org. Don't forget, please like and subscribe. Share with your curious friends every time you do an angel gets its wings. And if you like this, consider checking out the Patreon and just get more of this Animalia stuff. So thank you so much for listening. And I will see you next week. Next week.